Good morning and welcome to the second lecture of the Norfolk Society of Arts 2021-2022 lecture series. My name is Alice Kozial and it's my pleasure to serve as president of NSA. It remains unfortunate and disappointing that we're still unable to meet in person, but I'm extremely pleased that we're able to provide you virtually the second lecture of our season. I hope each of you received your membership invitation in the mail in late August or early September. If you did not receive your invitation and you would like to join NSA, please visit our website at NorfolkSocietyOfArts.org. Your membership enables us to bring you the world-class speakers that you have enjoyed year after year, and we thank you for your support. Norfolk Society of Arts has identified today's lecture as the Mabel Brown Lecture. Mabel Sutter Brown was an ardent supporter of NSA in the early years of the organization. Her brother George donated funds to NSA in her name over 60 years ago in the early 1950s and a lecture was designated in her honor. I know that Mabel Brown and her brother George would be pleased, just as I am today, to welcome Daniel Fenimore, Associate Director Exhibitions, the Russell W. Knight Curator of Maritime Art and History at the Peabody Essex Museum as our speaker. Daniel Fenimore holds a Bachelor of Arts from Vassar College where he studied anthropology and art history and an MA and a PhD from Boston University where he studied archeology. span He conducted extensive research and was awarded was awarded the uh, dissertation award for the Society of American Archaeology for his outstanding doctoral dissertation on maritime research in Belize with a focus on European and American maritime communities, both at sea and ashore. Finmore is the director of the Institute for Global Maritime Studies, an honorary member of the Salem Marine Society, and has served on the Executive Council of the International Congress of Maritime Museums, the United States National Committee of the Census of Maritime Life, and as director of the Council of American Maritime Museums. Dan has written over 40 articles and chapters for academic and popular publications and is the author and or editor of seven books, including Capturing Poseidon, Photographic Encounters with the Sea, Maritime History as World History, and Fiery Pool, the Maya and Mythic Sea. He has organized more than 15 exhibitions of American and European painting and decorative arts at the Peabody Essex Museum on a wide range of maritime topics. In his role as the Associate Director of Exhibitions, Dan identifies and develops exhibition strategies that broaden the existing visitorship to the museum to include new and more diverse audiences. His job involves the management, interpretation and display of a collection comprised of 50,000 paintings, models, charts, ship lines, navigating instruments, and decorative arts. He has received grants from a diverse range of supporters for his research and exhibition projects, including the National Endowment for the Humanities, National Science Foundation, and National Endowment for the Arts. He curated the 2017 traveling exhibition, Ocean Liners, Glamour, Speed and Style, which was curated with the Victoria and Albert Museum. More recently, he served as co-curator for the 2021 summer headlining exhibition in American Waters, which showcases the transformative power of the sea in American life and re-envisions the role of the sea in more than 200 years of American painting. His recent exhibition and book on ocean liner design was co-organized with the Victoria and Albert Museum in London and in partnership with the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art in Bentonville, Arkansas. Please join me in welcoming Daniel Fenimore as he speaks with us on In American Waters, The Sea in American Painting. Hello, everyone. Good morning and I'm glad you are tuning in today. Um, I am 
uh, here because I have a real soft spot for this organization. I have to admit that the last time I spoke to you about ocean liners uh, several years ago, I had a very interesting set of interactions with uh, the, the society. I had some great follow-up from members uh, who had some personal experiences with the subject and, and great interactions. So uh, I am very happy to join you again today. And I really hope that uh, we have a similar kind of, of enjoyable day as I did uh, several years ago. Since that time, I've been engaged with a different kind of project, uh, but one that's really um, engaged, uh, I've been focused on for many, many years. Um, but after Ocean Liners, I've moved forward with an exhibition and a project and a book called uh, In American Waters, the Sea in American Painting. And the crux of that project really has been the product of me looking across the landscape of American painting for many years and coming to realize that um, as a curator focused on maritime art, I've seen some artificial boundaries of sort of what constitute um, traditional marine art uh, in, in America, but that the sea infuses so much more symbolically and thematically uh, of American painting than people have uh, heretofore come to realize. And so casting the net more widely, uh, I have looked at the range of American painting from colonial times to the present and have found uh, so much more of the sea represented in American art than people have come, um, come to realize. I should say that this project is a, um, a cooperative one between my museum, the Peabody Essex Museum, and the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art in Bentonville, Arkansas. And my colleague there, uh, who arrived and found a collection, a broad-based collection of American painting that was not arranged to uh, emphasize sea maritime themes, um, as mine has been, uh, she found it everywhere as well. This was Austin Bailey. And so it's been a wonderful project um, I think you'll probably uh, enjoy it as much as I have to see that. Uh, the sea really does appear in so many works. Um, with that, I think maybe um, I'll jump right in to uh, the project and we'll take a look at a very unconventional approach uh, to interpreting the sea in American painting. So my project is culminated uh, in an exhibition of 90 paintings, which as we speak is being installed at the Crystal Bridges Museum in Bentonville, Arkansas. Uh, but if you can't make it to Bentonville uh, in, until before February when it comes down, um, you can enjoy the book that we have created for this uh, and which you'll have to excuse me for shamelessly promoting. Um, but let's delve right in. To start with, we are looking at a painting that, in my view, encompasses a lot of what our new definition of the sea really, really addresses. Um, it is a firsthand experience of the ocean. Someone, you, the artist, myself, standing at the edge of the sea, looking out. Uh, it is not a painting that is uh, defined by time, by a place, uh, by geography, by a particular maritime activity. So many maritime art projects are defined or organized by um, the kinds of industrial activity that we see at sea or the, by the region in which the artists worked. But this is a timeless picture. It is the human personal interaction uh, with the sea. It's by William Tross Richards. Uh, and uh, he, he is somebody who spent his entire lifetime sort of set up on the beach watching the waves crest and painting them uh, in a very realistic fashion. Um, a really very effectively one, effectively realistic one. But at the outset of the project, I wanted to make sure that we were not really experiencing something that could be compartmentalized into the um, Hudson River School, late 19th century um, notion of, of what realist art is. And so I'll also show you this painting by Arthur Dove, uh, which is a very, very similar experience of the sea but one by a modernist painter. So we're really not couched in a particular style or, or time frame as well. Uh, Dove's and Richard's experiences of the sea were quite different, but their modes of expression uh, of their experiences are quite uh, distinct. I think it's fair to say Dove was uh, an artist who we don't think of at all as a marine painter, uh, except for the fact that he lived on a houseboat. He did have this firsthand experience of the ocean, 
Uh, and during one storm, in, in, when he was on his houseboat and the rain was pounding on the, the roof and the waves were crashing against the hull, he wrote a letter to his dealer, Arthur Stieglitz, uh, stating that um, this is an incredible experience. And as soon as the rain stops, he's going to start uh, a painting about it. And so here we see that moment when the sky is clearing, the moon is clear, and the waves still relentlessly flowing towards him. Um, in that sort of that first hand experience uh, of the ocean, the marine environment. So, as I mentioned, instead of organizing the show either chronologically, geographically, or by maritime industry, we've approached the project from the standpoint of the first hand viewer's experience of the sea. Those of us who live by the sea, such as most of you, I suspect, and myself, have lots of first-hand exposure to walking on the beach, to looking out to sea, maybe to getting into a small boat uh, or even sailing transatlantic. Um, but many people have not. And so these artworks will convey that kind of experience. And in some cases, I think you know, very effectively so, uh, to the extent that uh, Americans have viewed the sea as a very emotional uh, element of their personal identity, whether or not they live on the coast. Uh, and so we've ex organized this project, and I think about it in terms of the firsthand experience with somebody standing at the edge. Here we are, what do you do when you go to the beach? What do you do at the ocean's edge? If you're not napping, I think the, one of the first things I do is stare out at the horizon, and I suspect I spend more time staring at the horizon than anything else. This is something that's innate in human nature. We look out where the sea meets the sky, where the land ends and where uh, the bigger world begins where earth and heaven sort of in intersect at that, that sharp edge. And there's a bunch of reasons that scientists and humanists can explain why this would be happening. I and mean, we don't need to go into those kinds of explanations, but this is a painting by Georgia O'Keeffe in a very modernist expression. We're looking at her. She is standing on the boardwalk at Old Orchard Beach in Maine and the wave is coming up towards her feet. That line in the center, that's not the horizon, that's a wave curling towards her. Looking farther back, we can see the swell of the ocean as the next wave is approaching her. And then all the way at the top is the horizon. And that dot is a lighthouse, which is way off up the coast a ways. And what she's essentially painted here is that vacant space, which uh, is all really only open in the vastness of nature when you're standing at the sea. That's a very hard thing for artists to create, I think. And I look at it in terms of what a traditional marine painting would be if you took the major subject away. Think of a ship portrait and then yank the ship out. That's what you've got. This foreground of the sea and this vast background of the sea uh, receding off into infinity in its way. So it's a very, very challenging subject, but I think very effectively done there. Many different artists have painted the sea in ways that um, are unexpected um, and that our personal experiences, even if they're not considered specialist marine painters. Uh, this is another one, Barclay Hendricks, who is an artist who painted largely portraiture, largely urban subject matter and people uh, in the 1970s uh, and into the 80s. And he was largely engaged with portraits of, of Black Americans and urban life and strife and uh, people who were really expressing their personal identities through their clothing and their hair. Um, and, and that's what he's known for. But when he would go on vacation and paint for himself, uh, he went to Jamaica and he would paint the sea. Nobody really knew about these pictures until after his death, they were in his estate. He painted several pictures, quite a few, of just this relentlessly sharp horizon looking outwards at it. And it's such a really kind of amazing thing to think that this is how he found solace and interest in nature when he was stepping away from all of that which occupied his mind uh, during uh, the rest of his career. I love this painting also because it really challenges our notions of the sort of relentless horizontality of the, um, the beach and of the ocean where there's that horizon line cutting through. He's chosen to, to give it to us in, in this round in a tangu format. And I think, you know, he's done that to be playful. Uh, my art historical colleagues would tell you that is emulating the field of human vision. We can basically see in this round vision. So this is a, a, a replicating his view of the sea, which may well be true. As a maritime historian, I can tell you that it looks to me an awful lot like a porthole.
getting back to William Charles Richards just very quickly, um, because there are very few artists who we've really engaged with on multiple levels, multiple paintings. I won't show you many today, but Richards is one who spent so much of his career painting the sea. This is a much more somber work than the first one we looked at. Uh, it's called Old Ocean's Gray and Melancholy Waste. Uh, and that sort of sets the mood, I think, for what he really wanted people to experience in this painting. Um, and it is much more of a, a open ocean scene rather than a beach scene like that. And we're looking right across to the horizon and with a title like that, which is a line from William Cullen Bryant's poem, Thanatopsis, it's difficult not to recognize that what he's talking about is um, approaching death, Thanatopsis in Greek, sort of in view of a peaceful death. Um, but you know, as, instead of just be making it a depressing view, we look all the way out towards the edge of the horizon, there is that bright, shining white line, which is just just before uh, the edge where we, we where the sea meets meets heaven, and so that I think is a very symbolic element to it at all, of course, as well. Um, I, th but as a painting of the sea at any level of interpretation, I think it's an extremely uh, effective and beautiful one. Traveling yet farther, and in this case, beneath the horizon, what lies beyond in an imaginative view by a painting, in a painting by uh, <clears throat> Edward Moran. Edward Moran and his brother Thomas Moran in the 1860s, 70s, and 80s uh, traveled America and, and even beyond, uh, but to painted some of the iconic images of the American landscape and some of Thomas Moran's paintings of Monument Valley and of the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone and so on in the American West are some of the most iconic images and famous images of the American West. Um, but they are really reveling in sort of the great vast open spaces and the depth. Thomas uh, Edward Moran, his brother who painted this, was also engaged in seascapes, um, but this is really a one-off. This is really a unique painting for Edward Moran and also for anyone at the time, because in the 1860s, we really had no idea. People didn't know what the deep ocean looked like. This is an era just before the real scientific oceanographic uh, projects uh, yielded scientific studies of the anemone and the corals and the seaweeds and things that you see here, which he has placed sort of in life, envisioning what it would have looked like in a landscape, I think it's fair to say that emulates that depth perspective and grandiosity of some of those Western views. But it's one that he had to compose um, strictly from his imagination in order to envision what the sea looked like, that whole you know, three fifths of the world that we are unable to see uh, by standing on the shore. So we've organized the show, here we were standing on the the horizon. And now another concept about um, how to interpret marine paintings involves these sort of images of the safety of shore. We are actually in boats. We are sailing. We are confident because we are just offshore. We're not in the dangerous deep ocean, but we are engaging in um, commercial activity uh, or yachting and pleasurable activities uh, and profitable ones. Uh, so this is sort of with the safety of the coastal views. And this is a painting by Frank Benson uh, of his daughters. Uh, in the 1890s, he painted a lot of these coastal views looking out at yachting activities. They're in their Sunday finery. Um, the sunlight is brilliant. Um, they're just reveling in um, a happy day at the seashore, uh, which of course in New England there are so few of. Um, but um, that kind of concept is one where the sea is a benign and yet actually a very benevolent um, uh, participant in a comfortable lifestyle. Fitz Henry Lane. Uh, this is a major work by Lane, which is, has not really been uh, seen, um, but down in, in, uh, where you folks are largely based, you might uh, spend time at the National Gallery of Art in uh, DC and have seen the companion piece, I think, to this painting, uh, which is called Becalmed Off of Halfway Rock. This is called Halfway Rock, and that is a rock off of Marblehead, Massachusetts, near me. Um, and here we see the basic daily activities of a lumber uh, brig and somebody pulling up a, maybe a fishing trap or something or a, or a lobster trap and just daily activity of of ships passing the rock which is halfway between Gloucester and Boston. Um, 
it's interesting to think about a painting like this. We look at it in terms of its authenticity and its realism. And um, those of us who live near this rock know what it looks like. And that cleft to the right is very authentic, although the beacon was washed away many, many years ago. And people think about Lane as painting these realistic views. Um, Lane got into boats and he would paddle around and he would sail around the subjects that he wanted to paint. Um, but there's a very interesting conversation that goes on around marine art and this notion of what constitutes authenticity and what constitutes real marine art. Um, and it's not one that we do today. I often watch people walk into my museum and stare at a painting and say, well, you know, the rig isn't quite right and the sails, the, the flags are flying in the wrong direction for the wind and, and they wouldn't be sailing in that direction with that orientation of, of the sails if the weather was like that. Um, you know, the real sailorly perspective. And somehow the implication being, if you don't understand all these things, you're not really qualified to see these, uh, to, to appreciate these paintings, which of course, as a curator really defeats my role, which is to try to broaden perspective and appreciation on this kind of art. Um, and that one should be able to enjoy it uh, at whatever level and for whatever purpose um, the artist intended. So here, what I see, um, you know, is a very authentic marine painting, even though in his day, there was a critic who complained that Lane was just a coastal painter. He wasn't really an authentic marine painter because he never did a transatlantic voyage to see what the ocean looked like in mid-ocean, which I think is, you know, frankly hilarious to think about um, because the guy spent much of his life uh, engaged with the sea and sea subjects. A true tour de force, not a, not a term that I apply to very many works of art in any category, but this is a work by Francis Augustus Silva that um, blows the lid off of <clears throat> uh, so many other marine paintings of the late 19th, uh, 19th century. This is about 1869 or 70. <clears throat> and Silva was a very interesting painter who was deeply engaged with this sort of important realism, this crystalline sort of representation of what he viewed as distinctively American views. He was a, he was a Civil War veteran. Uh, and as a painter, he was deeply sort of disturbed by his colleagues who would head off to other parts of the world, particularly Europe, to learn the techniques um, the, of the Barbizon school and, to, and they would come home or, or having learned in the impressionist painting and, and had applied that or were painting pictures of, of European subjects. He thought Americans should paint in the American style and they should paint American subject matter. Uh, and so what we see here I think is a classic example of that because um, <clears throat> he has set the scene in Boston Harbor. You may not be able to determine that so easily, but off there to the left in the distance is Boston Light and just to the left of that is Great Brewster Island. It's a very distinctive eroded shape. So we know that he's on the south shore of Boston looking north across the outer harbor. These are very distinctive American design sloops and schooners that he's presented here. So in his day, people would have known the function of these boats. The orientation of them is very realistic for the light air. But over that very, very studied level of detail, he has, he, or rather behind it, he has laid in an incredibly ephemeral moment where the sky has just sort of rippled with this chromatic radiance and this rotation through the spectrum from the blue to the pink to the purple and then back again. And so um, that, as we all know, appears in the sky for just five, 10 seconds and just in time for you to say to somebody, oh, take a look, you know, and it's changed um, because that is such an ephemeral scene. So for, for him to be able to overlay that aspect of nature and the American coastline with a very distinctive uh, detail uh, of the specificity of these ships was something I think that he, he really excelled in in his craft. And let's look very closely at some of his sketches because many of them survive. Uh, and at the top, we see these very carefully studied uh, ships at different points of sail and sometimes just a particular sail, a jib or whatnot, shown how it bulges out in different um, shapes in different types of wind there. So there's really a, a very careful study. And then down below, he's figured out how to lay down that paint to capture that glowing uh, sky in a very um, a fast manner. The one on the left is, is actually on a cigar box lid and I'm pretty sure he probably did that right out there. Um, while he was watching that sunset very quickly so he could capture the color palette and the radiance, the, the, the radiance of, those, of, that, of that rotation of, of colors. Moving in farther, um, we see a very traditional artist named um, 
James Edward Butters, were a classic of the, of the American marine art tradition. And he's painting a very specific race at a specific moment in time. People who viewed this painting in 1870 when it was created would have known that who owned these boats and what happened in this race. And he was very specific about the moment that this schooner rounded the light ship, which was the final leg of a mark of a, of a specific important race. And they outpaced the two sloops that you see uh, flanking it. You know, th these kinds of paintings tend to be um, discussed in terms of the historical detail that you're looking at, an accurate portrayal of the ship. The painting was probably created for the owner of the schooner. I wouldn't doubt that in an instant, but he's done so much more than that. Um, he's captured the momentum and the motion of the sea and of the boats in a way that's very believable, uh, breathtaking even. And I really, I've, I've, I find it fascinating to compare this painting uh, to uh, work by Charles Sheeler uh, from the 1920s, in which he has shown a very similar interest uh, in the momentum of boats and the motion at sea. Uh, there's, no, there's no right angles on any of these boats. They're very hard things to paint in their way. And the excitement of, pro this is probably the beginning of a race when the boats are so close uh, together. Uh, but he's not known as a marine painter. He has no interest in what boats these are, who owned them. He's just interested in, in the exhilaration uh, that one would feel watching these things move through the water. And so, you know, comparing the two together, I see that what I just described about Sheeler, Buttersworth accomplished just as effectively. Um, and so looking back at some of these 19th century works, and now having seen that, that kind of specificity stripped out in the 20th century, I at least have a new appreciation for how, how effective some of these uh, earlier marine paintings are and how some of these marine artists who have sort of been cast in the, as, as specialists only to be viewed by those who understand the race and the boats and so on is really not giving them due credit uh, at all. Experience of the sea is a very social one as well uh, and we need to keep that in mind because behaviors um, are different on board ship than they are um, uh, it, it, on land. And stepping aboard ship means you are free from certain social constraints, but it also means you have to conform to different ones. This is a painting by Julius uh, Stewart of uh, Americans, uh, friends of James Gordon Bennett on board the largest steam yacht of the day. Uh, lang sort of lying languidly relaxed um, in an informal pose there off of Venice. Um, they know that the public is not observing them. They are all celebrities in their own right. So if they stepped ashore, they would have to comport themselves differently. Yet here they are um, uh, relaxing uh, while at sea, getting away from it all, so to speak. Um, and it isn't strictly an upper class kind of phenomenon. This is also a painting um, by Julius Brutus Stearns from about 1870, in which um, a bunch of folks clearly have sort of um, chartered a small cat boat for the day to go uh, fishing. Uh, and it's, to me, a really fascinating painting because he, the artist is sort of cropped to the top of the cat boat and dragged your eye right towards the figures uh, in the center. And I have a close up here. And clearly he was very interested in portraying the emotions and the perspectives of the individuals who were on board. Uh, here they are fishing, really focusing on enjoying the day that they have uh, taken in, in, in dressed up and chartered the boat and they're stepping away from their daily lives. On the left, you see what I presume to be the guy who, who owns the boat. You can't see what he's thinking because his face is turned away, but you can tell what the person all the way to the right is thinking, who is obviously not enjoying the day quite as much as everyone else because he's uh, he appears to be seasick in that sort of pallid face. Um, above him is a very interesting aspect. Of, it's a sailmaker's stencil but it's actually used uh, by the artist. Uh, it says J.B. Stearns, 1871, uh, in the circle. So he's playing a little bit with uh, the, uh, sort of a tradition in marine art where artists have, have put their signatures in creative places. All the way back to the 17th century, you see this where Dutch artists would put their uh, names, they would sign their works on the transom of a vessel instead of you know, where the name of the vessel would be or on a piece of flotsam floating in the water. Marine portraiture is a very significant subject in its own right a uh, very large uh, portion of marine art um, or, and portraiture um, is engaged with the representation of people in their professions. Um, and strangely enough, the word portraiture is only applied to people, maybe cats and dogs, um, but living objects like that. Um, and not very many other works can be called portraits, except ships. 
we call a ship a portrait. Um, and why do we do that? Um, something to ponder. Um, there are explanations, none of which seem ironclad to me. But here we see um, a ship captain uh, portrayed by Charles Wilson Peel in his cabin. You can tell he's in his cabin because he's uh, the, the, the windows behind him are canted outward. You can tell he's a captain because he uh, has the telltale compass hanging over his head, which is his way of keeping track of what the helmsman is doing on deck to make sure that he's following his instructions. On the table in front of him is a chart and some dividers, so he's clearly in charge. Uh, it was painted in the 1780s. Similarly, this is a painting, another by Fitzhenry Lane of the ship Southern Cross in Boston Harbor, and it retains certain attributes that tell us very specific things about this ship. A portrait might be something that we presume to exist in life beyond the frame of the canvas. Maybe that's one of the attributes we, we think of when we talk about portraiture, because the painting here shows an actual ship, and there's key elements that tell us that. The, the figurehead at the bow, the name board, the flags flying in a very particular configuration, which in the 19th century people might have read to know that which exact ship this is and who the owners were. Um, and beyond that, if you look amidships uh, to the horizon line, you can see the bulging uh, building, which is the state house telling you that this is Boston Harbor. So all of that kind of encoded specificity built right in, just like in a portrait of a person. George Washington. Now, what would George Washington, painted by Gilbert Stewart, be doing in an exhibition and a project like this? Well, let me tell you. Um, there are very few, if any, other paintings of George Washington that have a seascape in the background. Uh, he was not particularly concerned with the sea. He that was this was not really his uh, um, his um, concern uh, politically. Uh, he was not interested in investing heavily in the United States Navy. He thought that American's international commerce should engage in diplomacy and should be able to defend itself. Um, there were experiment, you know, the experiment of the of early America federal period with whether we needed a Navy at all. Um, and that became quickly apparent that we did. But in the 1790s, it was still somewhat of an open question. Now, this painting has the seascape in the background for a very very significant reason, and that is that it was painted as a gift for uh, Alexander Hamilton, who was indeed very interested in international affairs and maritime activity and, and naval uh, presence at sea. Uh, he was born in the Caribbean. He had a much more international perspective, perhaps, than Washington did, but um, he was also involved in forming what uh, became eventually the Coast Guard, and this particular painting was uh, created as a gift for him uh, to acknowledge his part in negotiating the Jay Treaty, it was uh, 1794, I think, uh, in which uh, it, there was an attempt to reduce uh, tensions with the British, uh, allowing Americans to trade in more of uh, the British colonial ports uh, and uh, to reduce the um, impressment of American sailors on board ship. That, of course, did not um, work out in the long run, but uh, Hamilton was very concerned with that and that international perspective um, in a portrait of uh, the nation's leader was something that um, I think symbolically uh, wraps up America's uh, international aspirations at the time as they emerge as an independent nation uh, from being having been a colonial one. Of course, Black Americans have been involved in maritime activity and, and naval activity since uh, the origins of the country, but they do not often appear in painting until World War II. Uh, here we see a special training unit um, being sort of inducted uh, in the Great Lakes. Again, sort of a, a bit of an expansion of our notion of what constitute American waters. Uh, and a portrait by Huey Lee Smith of his commanding officer uh, named Nelson, who was one of the first commissioned, uh, black commissioned officers uh, in the US Navy in the 20th century. And so he's sort of honoring and acknowledging this man's leadership in bringing up other um, black sailors uh, into positions of authority in the Navy. Uh, the Navy was traditionally perceived as one where black Americans could advance uh, better than they could in other services. And so um, there, uh, there were integrated ships uh, in starting in World War II and, and shortly thereafter. So this was a, um, a, a moment that we see in these paintings that uh, captures the experience sort of uh, cap, uh, running up from 150 years um, of, of there being an, a, a relative absence of, of Black Americans being seen in these paintings. 
let's step uh, beyond portraiture and let's go offshore. Let's go uh, farther out to sea where Americans are engaged in international waters and encountering people from around the world, engaging in their commercial or naval or diplomatic activities. So this is really um, American waters writ large. What I see here is a painting by Michel Felice Cornet, America's first dedicated marine painter, uh, painter of ships in the sea. And it is a ship called the America, uh, owned by George Crown and Shield of Salem, Massachusetts, my hometown. And they are sailing to Europe and they're crossing the Grand Banks and they are in, within an international fleet. There's a British flag and a French flag and maybe several others in the background. And so America is encountering and being uh, greeted in a way uh, among the international maritime community. A few decades later and farther afield, we see um, Fiji in what appears to be sort of an unfettered view, an unadulterated image of pure sort of um, oceanic bliss. Um, we see some two sort of careful studies of two Fijian watercraft, and we see um, a, a village in the background um, across the landscape. And this is a painting by Titian Ramsey Peel, who was on board the US exploring expedition of the late 1830s and early 1840s. He was a scientist. So the notion of, of artists who were traveling and the purpose of artistic creation uh, is something that, that um, runs throughout the time uh, of American marine painting. And so um, it's interesting to me to see the perspective as well. I can envision this is a very small painting, which he quite likely painted from the deck of the ship that he was on, the USS Vincennes, uh, because it's sort of an elevated one. Um, and there's a good reason for that, because uh, Peel did not get along with the commander of the, uh, of the expedition, Charles Wilkes, um, who would not give him a small boat in order to go ashore and to conduct his scientific studies and create his, his paintings. Um, so he had to do it from the deck of the ship, something he complained about bitterly in his journals, uh, interestingly enough. John Burton Cheney, an artist who I'd be surprised if many of you have heard of. There's probably eight, 10 or 12 of his paintings um, that I'm familiar with. He was a whaling captain out of San Francisco who apparently was also considered to be an inveterate painter. Um, other crew members on his ship said that if he ran out of the paint that he brought with him uh, on the voyage, he would steal the ship's paint in order to keep uh, at working. And what those ships would do in the 1890s out of San Francisco on these whaling voyages, they would head up through the Bering Straits. Uh, they would go over the top of Alaska, deep, deep into the Arctic waters, over the Yukon, and then freeze themselves in intentionally um, so that in the springtime when the ice broke up, they would be there when the right whales, I believe, would rise uh, and start to feed and that they could hunt the right whales there. Um, they, uh, that was only successful for about uh, three or four years and then they hunted out the, that, those whales. Um, but I think looking at this painting, we see that kind of activity in its, in its sort of, in, its, in some. Uh, because he's there for a very long period of time in the Arctic winter waiting for the ice to break up. The ships are there as a community. I, I see this painting, I sort of read it as if it's a, um, it's a sea chart, right, with big empty white spaces in between little activity areas. We've got the ships themselves uh, that are frozen in. In the lower right you can see um, a block of ice that's being transported by a dog sled so that they could melt it for their fresh drinking water. Um, all the way off to the right of the painting, you can see people are skiing. They're passing the time, waiting for the ice to melt, so they're skiing down that hill. Uh, in the foreground, even, there's some sporting activities. Uh, on the right, it, it's some kind of football or soccer. I'm not sure exactly what's going on, but on the left, it's clearly baseball. Uh, and a painting of baseball in the 1890s is actually a pretty rare event. Um, Burton Cheney actually talked about playing baseball, what he said, at 50 degrees below zero in fur uniforms. So they were pretty dedicated to finding ways to pass the time. Uh, Burton Cheney's career ended, um, uh, however, as a whaling captain when he um, ignored the instructions from the harbor pilot in Nome, Alaska, and hit a rock and sank the ship that had um, the entire season's harvest of whale oil on it. Um, and he was instantly fired and was never given command again, so I understand. Other types of voyages um, of Americans broadening our conversation here um, involve 
the methods by which many Americans arrived uh, uh, in North America, our immigration stories, so to speak, our stories of, of, of colonization. Uh, in this case, um, Middle Passage slavery, which is a subject that I think um, none, do, does not exist in American art very frequently. No slave ship owner ever hired an artist to paint a portrait of his ship, for instance, that I'm aware of. Um, and so finding paintings to represent this important facet of how so, so many Americans sort of ancestral association with the sea uh, has, has been challenging. But this is a very interesting one by an artist named Clement Drew, a Boston painter, um, because it's the only sort of symbolic image that um, I've ever found, seen of his. I've seen 20, 30, 40 of his paintings, and they are all decorative in nature. Sea um, uh, uh, waves crashing against lighthouses and so on. Um, ships rounding rocky promontories, but this is the ship abolition rescuing the crew of the ship colonization, which is on the rocks there to your, to your left. So this is his very sort of political statement about um, whether freed slaved people should be uh, returned to Africa, uh, recolonized, so to speak, or whether they should become American citizens. And apparently this is the only painting that we can use to um, recognize this fact, but Drew was an ardent abolitionist. Would we have ever known this if this painting hadn't survived? No, absolutely not. It's really interesting uh, that this thing has survived. And here's a close-up of it in the foreground. You can see this barrel of New England rum floating, which is sort of um, identifying uh, New England's culpability in uh, the enslavement of people in the Caribbean. And then farther in the background, we see um, Boston uh, light and Boston Harbor and uh, the city farther in the background there. Another uh, major method of arrival in the country and origin stories that so many Americans can relate to is that of immigration uh, and travel on board steamships, uh, often in steerage class. And this is a painting by Teresa Bernstein, which is pretty much of that subject. And I, uh, again, a very unusual uh, subject to find in paint. Uh, she was herself an emigrant from Poland as an infant, um, and this was painted in the 1920s, um, where we see what appear to be Eastern European passengers wearing, uh, I say that because of the clothing that they, they seem to be wearing, standing on the deck probably in nice weather, and they are um, sort of, there's some tension in the air, there's little communities of people talking, but you're also seeing um, people looking out pensively, no doubt wondering what the world holds for them upon their arrival uh, in their new new place of, of abode. Other kinds of voyages, uh, again, looking at artists who were actually traveling with um, expeditions who were part of naval uh, forces and so on. This is an artist named Xanthus Smith who was not an official painter of the Navy, but was given access to small boats so that he could sketch and uh, paint uh, ships and the subjects that he was participating in during uh, the Civil War uh, so that he could create large scale paintings of them later on. This is the bombardment of Fort Fisher, the final naval battle of the Civil War, the fort on the left, the monitor class vessels in the center. These of course are the uh, interesting, strange um, technological and developments that the Civil War had wrought uh, for naval purposes. And on the right, we see some of the older ships um, that are staying farther afield from the fort in order to, to bombard it from a, a safer distance. Uh, Xantha Smith is interesting to me largely because he spent, as a veteran, he spent the rest of his life painting sort of commemorative portraits of his experiences, and some of them were commissions from his fellow uh, sailors and soldiers who had participated in the events that he had painted. So there's an assumption of a sort of authenticity, which we keep referring back to again, um, in these kinds of paintings. This is how it happened. It's history um, written uh, with, with, ink, with paint on canvas. That's not um, a 19th century phenomenon. This is Thomas Hart Benton. Uh, he was a World War I official Navy artist. Um, by, world, by World War II, he was still painting the subject matter, not as an official artist, uh, but he chose a very unconventional subject here. Um, he painted the perspective of uh, the submariner, uh, their entire vision of World War II uh, taken from within, uh, from, from under the sea, um, a very rare 
uh, kind of topic uh, to be addressed uh, in marine painting, um, but one that I, I find to be really sort of evocative of uh, these poor souls who spent sometimes years uh, under the sea uh, engaging in their, their military uh, duties. We get a little farther along and we are in ports. Ports are very important places uh, in the maritime world and artists have always been drawn to them because they are in some ways sort of the, the launching places where American ambitions, um, economic and social and otherwise, reach out across the globe. But they are also the places where sort of cultures mingle. They are cosmopolitan locations where people from around the world and ideas um, and attitudes from around the world enter into the United States as well. So some people have perceived them to be dangerous places in that respect. This is a painting from 1802, uh, probably the first painting of an American ship launch, or at least the first one that I know of, uh, in Salem, Massachusetts, actually. And the whole community has come out, as you can see there in the foreground, to celebrate this because everyone had an interest in the success of a ship like this, whether or not you were invested in building the ship or your family members were on board or not, the success of the town. Um, right, right, right on uh, um, the success of a ship like this. I have a close up to show you the range and the breadth of the types of people who all came out to celebrate the launch of this ship. Uh, George Ropes was a deaf mute artist and was the was trained by Michel Felice Cornet, who was I referred to earlier as the first marine painter in America. Driving more deeply directly at the social side of things, this is a painting by John Greenwood from the 1750s, quite early, for, uh, sort of an American portrait, uh, sort of Hogarthian caricature of Newport sea captains who are celebrating uh, in Suriname. Uh, they are engaged clearly in the sugar and rum and slave trade from um, from Newport to South America, and they have engaged, they, they have undertaken a voyage. They are out from the social pressures and the watchful eye of Newport society. They're cutting loose. They're no doubt in a, in a successful economic venture. They're celebrating that. They are drinking, they're smoking, they're pulling pranks on one another. They're getting sick. Um, this is a moment of, of great, you know, sort of celebration. Um, but at the same time, we can see clearly that the very, very well-dressed Newport sea captains uh, in their finery are surrounded by the very scantily clad uh, servants, uh, the native um, uh, Suriname uh, people there, or the slaves that were, were serving them. And so it is a sort of in the Hogarth tradition, uh, very much of sort of a, a bit of insight into their character and poking fun at them at the same time. That again, something there is a, a continuous sort of trajectory of interest in. Um, we see here uh, in the 20th century a very similar subject, 1934. This is by Paul Cadmus, and he calls this painting The Fleet's Inn. And as you folks in Norfolk don't need to know about what happens when a ship comes in and sailors are given leave and they've got some money in their pocket and they're freed from that arduous uh, four-hour watch and whatever oversight you know the commanding officer would would have for them and their dangerous lifestyles they are they are just dedicated to living life to the fullest in the time that they have um, and so um, he really went to town. This was in, in, I believe, in New York, where Cadmus was painting at the time, although he was commissioned by the uh, Corcoran Gallery for the WPA project for an exhibition. Um, and the painting received quite a bit of attention before the show even opened, and the Secretary of the Navy heard about it um, and actually had it pulled from the show because he said it was not true to the Navy. It did not represent sailors as he thought they should be represented. Um, and then when Cadmus was asked about it, um, he asked, you know, who he was caricaturing here and what was going on. He said, he just simply said, I paint what I see. Um, and what I find so fascinating about this painting is that, yes, it's easy to poke fun at that moment in time with the sailors probably drunk or really cutting loose, but it is an equal sort of portrayal um, in caricatured fashion of the sailors as it is of the people on land who have come down to interact with the sailors to see the opportunity to enjoy in those festivities. Um, so the women who are engaging with them are seen as both sort of excited and also um, strangely sort of um, unappealing at the same time. The woman all the way to the left, um, the, the, the other kind of perspective, she is turned off by all the activity and he's making equal fun of her. So he's really spreading it around. 
Um, there's a homoerotic scene in the background, which I think it was never discussed uh, in the 1930s in any of the copious press uh, that was was printed about this painting. Um, but which clearly was an element in the, in the distaste for it at the time. And uh, the painting was thought to have been destroyed for many years, but then it turned up in the 1990s. I was told in the uh, private club of uh, what was then the Secretary of the Navy. Uh, so maybe he liked the painting too much instead of uh, having disliked it, or it wasn't for public consumption in any event. And our final section that I want to talk about today, we call beachcombing. So we have stepped to the shore, we have gone to sea in safety, we have really reached around the globe, and we have come back through a port, and we are on the beach. Now, beachcombing is something that so many of us have engaged in. You wander the beach, you look for items of financial value, of curiosity, of of um, potential consumption. Um, in, the, in the 19th century, people wandered the beach for a lifestyle. You know, some, from some beachcombers were, were threatening characters. The beach in the, it, up until the 20th century was not a place that people really went to for pleasure, um, but they went to out of necessity and they were often desolate places. Uh, today, the beach represents something completely different. And it's one that I think artists have gone to for artistic inspiration as well. We all find the beach, and poets as well have found the beach to be a place where we think differently and we think more expansively. Uh, this is a painting by Kate Walkingstick. Um, and she is a Native American uh, artist of Cherokee um, descent, I think, who, um, who is, is mostly engaged in her entire career with more abstract paintings. But her entire life has been spent, she's gone to um, the coast of New Hampshire uh, for her summers and only late in life did she decide to try to paint seascapes and this is one of those that she created quite successfully. It's not at a deeply seated sort of historical view at all. It's Newcastle Island near Portsmouth. Uh, today there's a modern rocky breakwater over there so we're not really um, thinking back in time even though there is that Native American basket motif that she has overlain in the lower right uh, declaring this land and the shore and the sea to be indigenous uh, territory then um, and now as it was then. One of my favorite paintings in the show, and I'm very pleased to have say uh, that I refrain from saying that for so many of the other paintings I've shown. This is uh, Howard Pyle and a painting called Marooned from 1909. And um, one of the my goals for including a painting like this is to sort of rehabilitate the career of Howard Pyle as be, having been so much more than what some people would view as just an illustrator, because illustrators, and especially in the maritime tradition, have been enormously influential in our perceptions of the sea and of American history. Here he has created this image of this pirate that has been cast ashore. Uh, he's been rejected by the pirate community. Howard Pyle did something that um, I think few people recognize. He was really the first uh, writer, author, and, and, and painter to recast the notion of piracy from having been a, a brutal, a murderous, an outlaw kind of activity to something romantic that embodies what I would really think are American values of independence, of crafting yourself, be your own man, get out there, grasp opportunistically at the riches that um, lie before you, create, create your own social identity um, as the, the community of, the, of, of, of uh, pirates uh, are thought to have been where you needed to sign the articles and join their confederation. Um, and if this, art, this, this particular uh, pirate stepped out of that community, um, he was treated uh, harshly because he was either with them or against them. And so strangely and interestingly enough, this is a very large format painting. It was created for the Hotel DuPont um, as a public kind of um, view. I, I'd like to know what they were thinking when they commissioned this painting of Pyle. But I really, I, I think it's very, very effective and one that um, embraces American values in a, in a distinctive way. And finally, the last painting I want to show you today is by a current art star, I think it's fair to say, uh, Amy Sherald. And Amy Sherald um, painted the portrait of Michelle Obama, which is currently on tour with Kahindi Wiley's portrait of, of Barack Obama, um, traveling the country. Um, this is a monumental work. It's about 10 feet high. And what she's created is something that I believe is, is visually very compelling. It's, it's just a beautiful, excellently crafted work. The color palettes, the, the, the patterning, um, the integration of all of these things is very visually sort of arresting. You stop and you stare at it. And at the same time, what you're looking at is something that 
is also sort of jarring in its way because you don't really know what you're looking at. You're trying to figure out why are these four um, teenagers who seem to be cavorting on the beach, they're not really smiling, they're staring out at you in sort of almost an accusatory way. Um, they're wondering, you're wondering, what are they thinking? Uh, Amy Cheryl describes the works in this series of her paintings as um, sort of doing painting subjects that we all see every day in real life, but we don't see in art museums, like black people at the beach. So she's sort of crafting this notion of something that um, she knows will demand our attention and we, we will call out in some fashion as being different, but which um, also is something quite natural that we see every day and, and causing us to reflect upon that kind of scene. So, you know, to that effect, I think it's fascinating to see how for her the beach uh, as a place of recreation is also a great opportunity for her to um, express certain American values, this particular moment of time um, when we are all struggling and talking about these kinds of issues. Uh, and so um, on that note, I think maybe I will um, wrap it up for the moment and I look forward to questions that you will have. Insightful and informative lecture. The paintings were diversified, unique, and truly magnificent. The colors on your slides were vivid, brilliant and just spectacular. Many of our audience grew up in Tidewater and your lecture has held a tremendous appeal for us. Thank you for agreeing to take questions from our audience this morning. The first question that I've been handed, you mentioned that there are several views as to why ships are categorized as portraiture. Would you please share your thoughts on this? Well, I like that question because it's it's sort of on the on the edge of things that I've been thinking about, um, but I don't want anybody here to to hold me to any of these as as hard and fast decisions because uh, the notion of a ship being a portrait uh, it's the only thing that I can think of. If if you paint a picture of a cat or of a dog, um, you can call that a portrait, um, and, and of course of a person. But other I don't think think of any other inanimate objects that we think about and that we call portraits. Um, if you paint a picture of your house or your barn, uh, those aren't portraits. So, I, you know, I think it probably comes down to the notion that there's an object outside of the picture that exists in real life uh, and that the artist is accurately portraying some aspects of that object. Um, and so there's this sort of assumption that there's a bit of artistic liberty that's being uh, taking place, but for the most part, it's a representational uh, realistic view. But beyond that, what I think is interesting is that a ship is always in motion. So a ship in some ways is alive. It's, it's um, the artist freezes it, but when the artist is creating a picture of a ship, the ship is rocking uh, in the water. And so it's thought of as an animate object in that regard. And so I like to think along those lines in terms of it being, um, you have a figurehead and you're breathing life into this uh, ship in a certain fashion. So that's where my mind goes uh, in that direction. Thank you, Dan. We've got another question. How does the American tradition of depicting the sea differ from that of other countries? There is something I think that is clearly aspirational about American representation on the sea that is expansive in its way. Americans engaged in activities overseas uh, in the distant you know, climes of where Americans have sailed their ships. Um, even just, just when it's just offshore, there is a certain level of confidence that's being represented and there's a certain level of um, sort of economic success and enjoyment uh, that's showing people who are um, engaged in pleasurable activities, engaged with the sea as, as one in a way. Other countries, you know, some of the great nations uh, that founded the, the genre of marine painting, the Dutch, um, the uh, British, the French, all have their marine art traditions. Um, the Dutch, some of the earliest paintings of the sea are of shipwrecks uh, and they are sort of um, symbolic representations that one could read 
about the voyage of life and so on, and they are moralizing tales in their way. Uh, one of the things I hadn't fully appreciated until we started this project is that there are greatly fewer representations of American ships uh, in danger and shipwrecks than there are of European paintings of the subject. Uh, Americans don't like shipwrecks as much. Um, I was somewhat disappointed because I wanted to include some great shipwrecks, um, and we do have uh, you know a couple of, of hints at that subject, but uh, nothing like the Dutch, who clearly viewed the threat of the sea as a far more prominent element in their paintings. Uh, and then the British tradition is one much, much more of uh, naval activity. Uh, and they are representing the ships of state and they are representing the nation uh, in a holistic view. Whereas Americans certainly have though that element in, in American marine painting, but you see a lot more commercial activity and you see a lot more sort of independent uh, Americans in yachting voyages and in small boats that are extending commercial activity and that sort of, um, you know, the, the joy of, of being at sea as a, as a solo individual at the same time. So there really is that kind of framework of, of the unique attributes of what's American uh, in marine art. Thank you. I have another question. So many of the early images seem to be from New England. Were these artists familiar with the work of each other? That's something that I've struggled with and grappled with quite a bit because when you look at the the sort of traditional marine artists that people <clears throat> categorized as specialists in marine, um, there were a cluster of them in the Boston area. There's a cluster of them in the New York area um, and very little archival material survives from of these people. And it's frustrating because other artists, more mainstream American painters might have all uh, worked together uh, in an art colony or they might have all worked in the 10th Street studio in New York and clearly they knew each other and they wrote letters and we have patrons who you know, wrote about them and saved their own paperwork. But some of these painters who you know, worked the waterfront uh, and painted images specifically for the ship owners um, there's very little and sometimes just about zero archival material. But when you look at them stylistically, clearly they knew what other the, uh, their, their compatriots were up to. Uh, so we're at that level of research, unfortunately, just looking at visual elements that that can connect uh, to a large extent. And then in Boston in particular, you get a very strong marine art tradition. Uh, and so some of them worked in the lithography studios at Pendleton's lithographers and they got to know each other. Fitzhenry Lane saw what his uh, Robert Salmon, half a generation older than he was up to and riffed on his work. Uh, and then some of the later Boston artists, we assume were doing the same thing, um, but there's so little evidence. And I'm plodding away and I really do, you know, I've made some headway with some of these researchers. Uh, I'm sorry, in some of this research and the internet has been enormously successful and helpful to me um, even today, new documents being loaded into people's uh, archives and libraries. And so I will check the same names, um, you know, every few months to see if something has turned up, hoping for the mother load of uh, the diary of James Edward Buttersworth or something like that. So keep your fingers crossed, everyone. And one last question. Where did the 37 lenders of paintings to this exhibition primarily come from? They were all around the United States. Uh, we had loans that came from New York and Washington uh, and um, Virginia, uh, North Carolina, as far as California. Um, and so across the United States, a number of them, I know I mentioned at the beginning that a number of these paintings, the core of the show was from the Peabody Essex Museum where I work and from the Crystal Bridges Museum in, in Arkansas. Strangely enough, you know, we found that there is this core group of, of paintings that are deeply infused with marine themes in a place where no one would really expect them to turn up. So one of the challenges that I'm also really trying to overcome as a curator of marine art is to overcome the assumption that it one has to live on the coast to enjoy um, maritime painting. Uh, it simply isn't the case, um, and, and marine art generally. Um, I was told um, after we had opened the Ocean Liners exhibition, I was talking to the head of marketing for a major cruise 
line um, down in, in, in Miami. He said, after Miami itself, the number one market for the cruise company was Denver, Colorado. So looking for these things in, in out of context, I think, is really the important thing and breaking people's assumptions about where should we find these paintings? Where, who is of interest? You know, I know the Phoenix Art Museum has several very interesting marine paintings, for instance. So uh, they do appear all over and uh, many of the artists were from New England. Many of them were European immigrants who then came to New England and then traveled outward across the US so that um, there is a strong New England connection, but then it does infuse uh, the rest of the country. And that's where a lot of these works landed. Mm -hmm. Again, thank you, Dan. We cannot appreciate, we cannot extend our appreciation anymore. It's just spectacular what you have offered us today. The Norfolk Society of Arts Board does regret that we're unable to personally host you in Norfolk, but we do so appreciate the coordination it is required on your part to present your lecture today to us virtually. I'm happy to share with our viewers that Dan's lecture will remain on our NSA website through our 2021-2022 season. Our next lecture will be held on Wednesday, November the 17th at 11 a.m. We feel fortunate to welcome Scott Rothkopf, Senior Deputy Director, and Nancy and Steve Crown Family Chief Curator from the Whitney Museum of American Art. Scott will speak with us on Jasper John's Mind Mirror. Please remember that you can always find the most current information about our upcoming lectures on our website, NorfolkSocietyOfArts.org. Again, thank you for attending our lecture today. Be safe, stay well, and all the best to each of you.